Well, George, I wondered about one small point. You um, have been doing your act around about 30 years now. Mm -hmm. Actually, and 32 years. Well, 32, yeah, actually, even more than that. You are absolutely synonymous with um, the Irish tradition, but it wondered, I wondered, how often do you actually get back to Ireland, and is that important for your musical credentials, do you think? Yeah, well, it is important. Uh, you have to sort of keep a hand in what's going on over there as well, and one of the boys, Wilson, one of the original uh, Irish Rovers, lives and commutes from Larne, which is near Belfast, and I try and go back once a year, as most of the boys do. We all have families back there. My sister uh, lives in a small town there. She didn't immigrate with us, so I have a, a great reason to go back to see her, and I've got all sorts of nephews and uh, cousins. So I go back as much as I can, but it's uh, sometimes hard to get more than once a year in. So it's, uh, But yes, but you, ne you need to go back and refresh yourself and, and find uh, your roots and where everything came from and uh, to research new songs and steal a few songs off other people as they steal them off us. It's, it's part, of, part of it. Well, it's sort of flattering people to steal songs from you. Um, the, the, another thought went through my mind. We tend to see Northern Ireland through the eyes of CNN and it's as we we talked on the telephone prior to this interview and they always seem to dwell on the the worst aspects but what is life like in Ireland for the average Irish person these days it's like uh, right here in Mission or Abbotsford or North Vancouver or wherever you live uh, life in Ireland is exactly the same there's very there's very few um, troubles there at all and, and when the troubles do happen they're usually in a certain part of the of Belfast but the rest of, of the south of Ireland for instance there's no trouble um, you can go anywhere in Belfast. There's there's a brand new theatre called the Waterfront Theatre, and it's a gorgeous theatre. And um, all all of the acts, uh, all the Glen Campbells, all the big country acts, they all play in it. So it's it's a modern, thriving city. And the people who live there, they go to work. They like to go to the pub. They play. There's soccer. It's a normal life for most people. 99.9% .9 of the population just want to live a normal life and bring up their kids and do the right thing. I always think of your music, you know, being very much from Ireland, very much the island that I knew when I was there, when be, really before the troubles, uh, as they call them, yes. uh, euphemistically, were so uh, so rife. It seems to me to be a fairly pure form of Irish music, and it's very appealing to me as an expatriate. Mm -hmm. But is that sort of music still popular in Ireland these days? Well, funny enough, you're asking that, Terry. It it wasn't for the last, I'd say, ten years. Country music was very big. You would go into a pub hoping to hear some Irish music, and there they would have cowboy boots on and hats, and I left you know, all of these great things. Send me the pillow that you dream on. And then when they get off stage, says, "How you doing? Nice to see you again." These great <laughs> Belfast accents. But now it's gone full circle. Again. Again, so the Irish music is creeping back into the pubs, especially in the smaller country pubs. You'll, you'll hear the fiddles and the Irish pipes and the baron, which are Irish drums made out of goat skin and the tin whistles. It's coming back in, and it's it's like anything. It's the children have to b keep doing it. It doesn't matter if it's sports or music. It's you, the, the young children have to be playing the tin whistles and the Irish pipes to keep the uh, the whole tradition going, and that's happening again. Mm -hmm. You, as I said, seem to me to play a fairly for pure form of music. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that you have sort of made uh, a reputation of doing s very specific, not well, all your music is popular, but some very specific songs crop up in all your performances. Is that a, a straight jacket at all? I mean, do you sometimes find that you wish you could go further afield, but you'd be, uh, the audience would go away if you didn't perform those songs? Mm -hmm. Yes and no. Um, it, it's sort of hard to say anything against uh, a couple of songs that we have that sold millions of copies. So I really, without those songs, we would be playing in little bars somewhere back in Ireland. So I can never put down the unicorn or wasn't that a party. They're great songs. They're not Irish songs, but we happen to make them popular. And we're an Irish band, so a lot of people call them Irish songs, which is fine with me. And and I suppose, like I say, without those songs, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing and enjoying our lifestyle. So. I love those two songs. How, how do you manage to keep it so fresh, though? I mean, you must have performed. I, I hate to think how many times you must have performed those songs. How do you oh, keep it so fresh? I, I'm I'm the same. I hate to think how many times we've done it, but it's once again those are the songs that that took us out of the the folk clubs and put us onto the concert stages of the world, and and that's the reason. We, every time we sing them, it's I find when you when you finally get onto the stage, whether or not you're tired and you've driven a long way or you've got a headache, when you get onto the stage, that's your two hours to sort of shine. So you just you you have your, your exuberance is built in. It's uh, 
it's what show people have in them, I suppose. It's that little spark that starts about five minutes to eight and lasts till the end of the show. And then you might get back down and sit there with a long face and you're tired. But like I say, those two hours on the stage, you have the spark and therefore you can sing a song like The Unicorn every night for 28 years. How have the audience changed? I mean, obviously they do, you have audiences coming back, but I imagine that you're getting a whole new audience. How do they react? They, the young people, uh, the ones that we sang The Unicorn to uh, 28 years ago, who were five and six years old, are now in their 30s, and they're coming with their little children, and I think it's great. We've still got the older people who are always coming to see us, and sometimes we get the college students, so we get a nice cross uh, mixture of people, which is wonderful, rather than just like, for instance, if you're a, a rock and roll group, you're usually playing 14 or 15 year olds and they can be very very fickle uh, after about three months they well, I don't like them anymore I'm gonna go on to the next group whereas with our type of an audience they always uh, they've always been there for us and it's it's a wonderful thing uh, you don't know how how happy it is as a musician to know that you're gonna go somewhere and the people are gonna be sitting waiting on you and you start to recognize some faces from years past and it's uh, it's a great feeling well actually the, the interesting you should say that because as you were saying that something flashed through my mind that that, that is the age the young people when and the, their musical appreciation is very much formed. I remember going to folk clubs as a young person, and the love of folk music has stayed with me all my life. This right. means you realize, don't you, that now you've got them hooked on you, you're going to have to be performing for another 30 years oh to keep God. them happy. <laughs> <laughs> as a matter of fact, uh, just before the party became a hit, I think it was 1983, we had, um, we had built some pubs across Canada for our older age and when we got tired of traveling. And so we were sort of coming into a semi-retirement sort of an idea, and and then the, the song wasn't at a party came along and it put us right back into traveling six months of the year and we, we were saying to ourselves I thought we had semi-retired we're working more now than we ever did and uh, there's a whole Celtic revival right now as you're probably aware of like some of the big uh, groups from the Maritimes uh, they have started this Celtic revival and it's gone right across of course the river dance is popular so all of a sudden there is a demand for a band like us again so we're there's all sorts of touring it's sometimes we have to say well let's let's not work this three or four weeks let's let's go home to Ireland or let's spend some time with our families this is a two-month tour and I don't think um, well I know we haven't this is the longest tour of our whole career We've never done uh, two months before and it's it's a long long time so we're sort of looking forward to uh, getting home in the next week and relax well you sort of answered my next question because what I was going to say you was uh, uh, with all the practice you had at doing touring does it get easier or harder as you get older I think you've answered that <laughs> uh, you know what we were just uh, talking about it today and we were all raving because the hotel we're staying in has wonderful beds and we're saying oh, isn't this nice to have a really comfortable bed so that's how the touring is becoming I guess as you get older your your back isn't quite so sore in the morning if the bed is nice and uh, it comes down to who's got the best pillows and the best mattresses and uh, you can get a good pint in that hotel and the food's good I think as you get older it, it's hard to to uh, you're living out of a suitcase now for eight weeks that's what we're doing so your your day off is usually a Monday and uh, that's when you're looking for laundromats and trying to get your laundry done because you've got another six days of shows to do so it's very very base stuff that that we really do we're very very common people which is the way we've always been well I mean common and common yeah one of the things that I mentioned to you before we started this interview was that um, I think of your music as being a fairly pure form of Irish music. And you mentioned, of course, all the Celtic groups that are coming along, but many of them are putting their own spin on you know, heavy syncopation and so on. Right. Does that bother you? You strike me as being a very tolerant sort of guy. Does it bother you that they're not no. playing quite the pure music? No, absolutely not, because um, there's a lot of purists would say that we're far from being pure. They would say the chieftains are pure because they play all of these wonderful melodies, whereas we take them and we add words to them or we sing songs like maybe things like Whiskey in the Jar, and the real purists would say, ah, that's not even an Irish song and that unicorn is not an Irish song so whatever you know everybody has their own degree of purism and uh, ours is entertainment the chieftains are, are very traditional with their music they're great musicians and that's just the way it goes everybody is a bit different and and I'm glad they're a bit different because if we were all the same it would be a pretty pretty boring world every it's like people everybody's different and everybody has a different taste in music and uh, everybody has their own idea of Celtic music which is fine the younger groups probably yes have much more of a beat with their drums and all than we would use and that's that's just a natural progression of folk music I think 
Talking about your music, you've just brought out a new CD, which we I've have. got here, yeah. called Come Fill Up Your Glasses, yes. and we'll yes. take a close look at that. Tell us a little bit about this CD and what's on it. Okay, well, first of all, the sad part about the CD is it was it was Jimmy's last um, effort. Um, he died uh, about three months after we finished doing this album, and the hard part for me was uh, I do the mixing of the album. In other words, when everything is done, uh, you have 16 tracks on each song, so it's my job to put everything together and make it come out on the two little speakers this size to make it sound half decent so I was I was all through the Christmas break of this is this last Christmas I was working on this almost every day and of course I was hearing Jimmy's voice because I'm trying to mix everything together and it was a it was an um, unsettling feeling because I just um, first of all you know I, he was the first person I really fell in with when I came over from Ireland we met in Toronto we started the band together when I was 16 years old so I mean I've been with him almost every day of my life for the last 32 years and then for him to go so suddenly it was very very hard for me and then to listen to his voice was uh, is like the Twilight Zone or the X Files or something it was weird. The thing about that, and it must have been and a tremendous shock to everybody. Although I suspect from something you said to me that wasn't totally unexpected, but no. looking at his lifestyle, no. but it did cross my mind that he went out after a standing ovation and a, a ma most successful appearance yes. in Massachusetts, wasn't it? No, it was. Yes, he died in Massachusetts the night before we were in New York. I think it was Westbury, and we were playing there to a sold-out audience, and he got a standing ovation. They loved the jokes, and it was the next day we had driven to about 150 miles to. It was a day off, so we spent the day off. All everybody. Was was relaxing and he went to bed that night and he just never got up it was as simple as that and uh, I found him in the morning and he was he looked very peaceful he was he had just passed on in his sleep and without a struggle mm -hmm. so I suppose if we all we all have to go and that's probably not a bad way to go but he had had um, heart problems for the last uh, five years and the doctor had basically said to him you have to change your ways you have to stop eating so much and smoking and drinking and uh, John or John uh, Jimmy was our John candy is what I John Candy was the same. He lived life to the end, as did Jimmy. He just he went the way he wanted to go. It's sad, but I, you know, we all tried to to have him stop and and slow down, but he wouldn't do it. You've had a couple of um, uh, traumas during the course of the, the last few years, and also you've added some new faces yeah. to the band. Has that changed the band at all? Well, it, it hasn't really, and I'll tell you why. Uh, first of all, my brother retired from the band about four years ago, and it wasn't always on the best of terms when he first quit. There was a lot of unwritten things. That, um, when we started the band, the last thing we ever thought about was, first of all, A, making it as a band. We were doing this for a bit of sport. We didn't think anything would ever come of it. I was just finishing school, and I was very happy to get on the road at the age of just turning 17. So in those days when we started, we didn't really have any contracts in place for what would happen if somebody would want to leave. We figured we would all go out together or nothing would happen at all. So the day of somebody leaving the band after 30 years wasn't really looked after. So that's where the problems came in with lawyers and all sorts of things like that. And it got a little nasty. And uh, um, unfortunately, my brother liked to air things in the press, whereas I don't. We didn't. So uh, he sort of had this raging run against us in the press for about a year. So once we got over that, and now we're, we're sort of on speaking terms again, and it, that sort of smoothed over. And then, of course, we lost Jimmy. But the main the main idea of our band has always been to go out for two hours and we must enjoy ourselves as well it's not just for the audience <clears throat> you have to always think of your audience but if we don't enjoy it ourselves then we wouldn't be doing it so we we got a couple of new people to come into the band who are like us who enjoy it and we've known them for 20 years one of them is john reynolds who actually had filled in for jimmy over the last uh, 10 years he's done three or four tours with us when jimmy was sick or he also lost his throat for about three months at one point so so john reynolds wasn't a um, he wasn't a complete stranger plus he's a distant cousin of wilson's the accordion player so uh we still do the same material, basically. We still sell, tell the same gags, and everybody will groan and say, oh, I heard them tell that joke 30 years ago. But, you know, that's people like those sort of Murphy jokes. Um, so basically, it's the same type of show. It's because Will has left and Jimmy has uh, passed away, it hasn't radically changed at all. It's basically the same thing the Rovers have always done, and that's to have a bit of fun for two hours. George. You have got to go get ready for a performance, yes. so I'll make this the last question, but I want to ask it because, um, for the benefit of viewers, I know what the answer is, but it so impressed me when you told me this, I want to repeat it for the camera. Oh, I remember what it was. Oh, you will. <laughs> I asked you on the telephone before setting up this interview what it is that you are passionate about outside of music. Do you remember what you told me? Um, I'm, did I say anything about Ireland? Was it about Ireland? 
well, my wife probably, my family and my Irish setter that I brought from Ireland, <laughs> those are the things that are most important to me in life after, well, they're the first important things, then the band, and I think that's the way it goes from there. At all, when you're in this business for 30, this is my 34th year, I'm married to the same woman, we just had our 30th anniversary, and here's how, here's how tiring this tour has been. Betsy has been on the tour selling our merchandise. We, um, we did the show, we came home to our room, and we both looked at each other at the same moment and we said, this is our anniversary, isn't it? March 22nd, we both said, oh my God. And I said, you haven't got me a card, have you? And Betsy thankfully said, no. And I said, oh, good. <laughs> so we both forgot on it, which is just last week. And, um, but that's just, we've been together all those years and it's, uh, you know, I think you have to, when I'm traveling so much, she basically brought up the children, looked after the household and did all that sort of stuff. I couldn't have done it alone without her. So that's definitely my number one priority, no doubt about it. Well, I think that is a most charming answer, and I don't think we can improve on that. So no. what I want to do is simply say thank you so much for taking out a thank huge you. amount of your time. Well, well, Have a great show well. tonight. Well, we'll try it. And uh, we'll see you back here again in another 18 months. would love to. And as they say, schlanta, which means health to you all. One more. It could have been on the scene.